Okay, I think we're ready to start the second talk of this afternoon's session. I'd like you all to welcome Jack Moffat to tell us about learning in depth. Hello, everybody. My name is Jack Moffat. I'm a principal research engineer at Mozilla, and I work in the speech and machine learning group uh, these days. I've been here before talking about servo and all kinds of other things, and so this is sort of what I've been working on over the last year. Let's start here. So there's a couple different reactions you might have if you, when you see this product for the first time. One of them might be, hey, that's really cool. I can use this to talk to my family while I'm sitting in the kitchen and cooking. Um, and the other reaction is, why would anyone put a surveillance device made by Facebook in their house to <laughs> watch them all the time? And like, I, that's not really an uncommon opinion. Like, the, the Onion has already parodied this. You know, the CIA receives more funding for their Facebook program. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe it was to build these devices, right? Um, we can't, so these devices are, are often using these new deep learning techniques, which is a set of algorithms uh, developed out of the machine learning stuff. And they can do a lot of cool things, um, but they also have a lot of problems. Um, and we can't really undo discovering or using this technology, so we have to figure out some way to solve these problems. But before we can get to the problems, we, we should probably understand how this technology works. How many of you have know what deep learning is, how it works, and that kind of stuff? So roughly, roughly half. So this is going to be a little refresher, I guess, for you and an explainer for people who, who maybe haven't looked at this in depth, uh, because a lot of the problems come directly out of of how the technology works. So machine learning, like classical machine learning, is a way in which we're gonna build programs to solve problems, but instead of like actually writing code to do those things, and following specific steps, we're gonna calculate statistics from input data, and we're gonna use those uh, to make decisions. And the system can kind of learn by updating its uh, pro probabilistic models and things. So, so what kinds of things can we use it for? Well, these are not the best uh, applications, but these are ones that I created previously in my career. So I, I, I made a, a language detector at a, at a search engine that I made a long time ago. And so you can take bigrams or trigrams of characters and figure out a probability model for, for what that looks like for different languages. And then you can compare input text to the, uh, calculate the same stats on input text, compare it to the probability models for other languages, and you can detect which language is, is probably being used, which is pretty cool. You can also use it to generate poetry. So this is an actual piece of a sonnet that I found that got generated by one of these things. And this works by doing uh, Markov chain models where you know, for each input word that you see, you calculate what's the probability it's gonna go to some next input word just by ingesting a whole bunch of Shakespearean sonnets. And then uh, you just generate random numbers with those probability distributions to make the text. So how is deep learning different? It's different in a lot of ways, oh, so many ways. So classical machine learning depends on humans quite a bit to transform the input data into features that then we can calculate statistics about and, and do computation on. So these models in the interior are you know, naive Bayes, support vector machines. They're, they're doing these uh, calculations, and the input features are things that we've created. So like for if we're going to do uh, email spam filtering, the input features will be like words that we see in the emails. Um, but we had to figure out that like, you know, show, like, you know, have the intuition that certain words appear in spam emails more commonly than, than other emails. And then we're gonna output some prediction on the other side. Um, and the output here is, you know, for, for spam detection is obviously the probability that the email is spam. So for machine learning, we're gonna replace that middle section with a, a, a actually really simple function. So each one of these uh, A's here is, is, a, is a neuron, and it computes this function basically wx plus b, which is just a simple linear function, and then we're gonna run it through a nonlinear function called the activation function, and that's it. And we just have a whole bunch of these. And the idea here is that each of these can learn some new representation of the input data, um, and we can solve this. And so th that's kind of cool, but it gets way cooler when you have a bunch of these. So you can stack these up in layers, and the idea here is that each subsequent layer can learn more sophisticated representations of, the, of what the output of the previous layer is. 
So, uh, you know, things, things very deep in the network have very sophisticated representations about what's going on, whereas the things early in the network are, are pretty simple. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. One awesome thing about this is we don't have really have to do feature engineering anymore, because now we can just put the data in one end, and the network itself will figure out what the interesting features are and what the interesting representations are. Um, you might be wondering how on earth it could do this, and, and it's actually pretty magical. We basically, each one of these neurons has a weight associated with it, with just a floating point number. We're gonna initialize all of it randomly. And then we're gonna put our inputs on one end, calculate it with all those random weights until we get a Y, and then we're gonna compare that Y with the actual truth that we know. So like we put a labeled thing in on one end, we know what the answer is gonna be, but we, we test what it thought the answer would be, completely randomly initialized, and we compare that, um, and then basically we're gonna use that comparison to make the weights better. And so we calculate this what Y is versus the ground truth over and over and over, and we, we get a loss function. The loss functions might look like this if they were only two dimensional. Um, if only, like these things are many, many, many dimensional, like probably millions of dimensional. Um, so if we, if we only had two dimensions to worry about, we could compute this loss function. And the idea is that when we run a single example through the network, the loss is gonna be some particular value for the weights. Uh, and then we can actually use a bunch of fun calculus to find out, you know, what the gradient is at that point, and then we can update the weights along that gradient, and, and the loss function will be a little bit less, and now we can keep going. And we can run over the training examples over and over and over, and each time getting closer and closer uh, to the lowest possible loss. And so at the end of this, we end up with a network that hopefully has a minimal loss uh, across all these weights for, for our training set. And now it just works. Here's an, here's an example of what like these layers look like. So this is a, a, a bunch of uh, different layers, uh, visualizations of what activations look like at different layers in a convolutional network that does um, object detection. And so you can see these very early layers basically just to fi find edges in the images. And then the later layers uh, can find textures and, and go on, you can find patterns in those textures and then it turns out to be parts and then you know, you know much more sophisticated parts, and then you have sort of a fully connected layer at the end that can go, okay, if I have two eyes and a nose and a mouth, it's probably a face, right? Okay, so there's a bunch of different architectures for deep learning, uh, which makes it useful for a lot of different problems. Um, so let's look at a few of those. So we saw this one, which is just a fully connected network. Um, image data we process a lot of times with convolutional networks, which basically runs these tiny convolution kernels. They're like usually three by three or five by five um, on the input image. And then for every you know, three by three of the input image, we generate a pixel in the output. Uh, and uh, the cool thing about this is even the convolution kernels are initialized randomly. We let the network figure out what kinds of filters it needs uh, to find new representations. Um, then we take all these convolutions and put them in, uh, it, themselves in many layers. So we do a bunch of convolutions on the input image, and then we reduce the, basically we, we chop all of the images in, you know, in, in half in each dimension, so we have a smaller thing. Then we run another set of new convolutions on that smaller thing. And one of the cool things about that is these convolutions later in the network are actually looking at many pixels of the original image. Um, so the lower layers are working on smaller images, but the, the amount of the original pixels they sort of uh, compute over is getting larger and larger. And that's how they can detect these bigger and more sophisticated features. This gets used for things like object detection. So here's an example of what the output might be of an object detector. So it can uh, classify the objects that it detects, find bounding boxes for those, tell you the probability that it's one thing or the other. Um, if any of you were at the Cacophony talk this morning, they did a, did a very similar thing where they were classifying animals that they saw in thermal cameras. Um, and, and it actually looked very similar to this, except for they were heat images instead of um, RGB. Another interesting kind of network is recurrent networks, and these are ones we use a lot for our projects at Mozilla. And the idea here is 
that uh, you want to process sequences. So that these, these data comes in one at a time and the sequence of them is important. And so basically you have as input like whatever data you have, like a character for example, um, plus the previous value that came out of the network and then you generate a new, time, uh, basically a new uh, Y value and here's H of T. And then the next time you get, you know, H of T minus one and X, X of the current time and you calculate a new one and you keep going. And this is pretty cool because now these networks can remember things. So they can store information, remember things, uh, sort of reference items from the past. There's even bi-directional ones where they can know from the future and from the past and use that to make predictions about the present. Um, and you can do all kinds of really fun things with these. Uh, the, the thing we use these mostly for at, at Mozilla right now are, are, are speech technologies. So speech synthesis and speech recognition are, are use these, and basically in speech synthesis, we take in a sequence of characters and we output a series of these spectrograms and then we convert the spectrum, each spectrogram represents like 20 milliseconds of audio and we convert those into samples. And for speech recognition, we convert the incoming audio into these spectrograms and then we get as output a sequence of characters. One really interesting thing you can do with these types of networks is that you can take already existing uh, trained models and repurpose them for different things. Um, and basically the intuition here is if we take a giant, one of these uh, uh, deep networks, and we train it to recognize like a thousand different types of objects, um, and we get, it gets really, really good at it, and then we wanna make like a face detector, well we can take our pre-trained thing that knows a thousand different things, and it probably already knows good representations for faces and all kinds of other stuff. And so we can just start from there. This also really helps when you don't have a lot of data for a new problem, but you did have a lot of data for sort of a related problem, because now you can take uh, this network that you trained on problem A that has tons and tons of data, millions of images or whatever, and just like sort of slightly tweak it for your own purposes. So for example, here's the same convolutional network we, we saw before that might be used for object detection, but we can just sort of cut off, put new input in and change how the output is calculated, and we can take images of humpback whales and use it to identify individual whales since their tails are unique. And we don't, and you can do this either by taking the interior weights and never changing them and just changing the fully connected layer that you put on the end, or you can actually wire it all up together and retrain the whole thing and it will still, it will work that way too. <coughs> Another uh, type of this, uh, kinds of networks are gener generative, generative adversarial networks, which is also really hard to say. Um, and here you take two of these networks and you train them against each other. So here we have a generator which is trying to make fake images, um, and then we you know, randomly select between real images and fake images for the discriminator, and it tries to pick which one is the real one and which one is the fake one. And obviously as the network gets better, one of them has to start generating better fake images to fool the discriminator, and the discriminator's gotta get better uh, to tell them apart. So these networks get better together. And this can do some really weird stuff. So NVIDIA uh, built a model that does this. They can generate faces that, uh, you know, of non-existent humans that look pretty good to me. And it can even do this in, it does this with a thing called like style copying basically. Like they can generate multiple <laughs> versions of this face with different styles. So you can say, okay, I want one with long, you know, I mean, it's, it's not quite like long hair style, but you, you can sort of, uh, like their application has sliders that you can uh, move in real time uh, to tweak the faces. Okay, now we get to the problems again. Um, so there's a lot of problems with technology in general, right? Like we, we all work on open source stuff and one of the four freedoms is freedom for use for any purpose and, and you know, some people use the stuff we do for things that we would prefer them not to, like making weapons or all, all kinds of other things. So all of that, of course, exists for deep learning. People are using object detection to, to pick targets for weapons and things like that, which is all you know, relatively normal. We're, this is a problem we've had before. It's not a new problem. But there are a bunch of new problems um, with deep learning that sort of come out of how it works um, that I think we should be concerned about. So the first of all is that they're like the zombie horde. They have an infinite appetite for data. And this is because, unlike sort of the classical machine learning methods, 
Deep learning keeps getting better the more data that you give it. And it just, it, apparently, it just keeps getting better the more data that you give it. And so what you have happen is when you get these huge multinational giant corporations competing with their products, competing against each other, it, you have an economic incentive for them to get as much data as they can so their model is better. So that makes the other people want to get as much data as they can so their model is better. And ostensibly, these people are trying to do this for a good reason, to make better products for us. Um, but we have to trust that, you know, they're not using that data for something else, and, and that like they're the only ones with access to that data, and things like that. So for example, if you have a Alexa or a Google Home or one of these other smart assistants, um, the, the more voice data they can train on, the better those products get, which means they're going to save everything you ever say to it so they can use that to make it better. Um, and that's kind of scary. But it comes directly out of this thing that the more data you give these models, the better they get. So it's, they're, just, they're just trying to improve things. Another one is that deep learning is computationally very expensive. Like this has been known for a long time, these techniques. And some of these networks uh, that people are using today are networks that they, you know, figured out how to do in the 90s or the early 2000s, but weren't practical to actually train until we got GPUs, um, which, which with deep learning and uh, uh, Bitcoin may grow to be the root of all future evil. Um, so it takes, like basically, large, network f large networks take these giant farms of GPUs to train. And even inference can sometimes require a GPU. So I think our uh, deep speech uh, model that we have at Mozilla will run in real time on a CPU, but lots, lots of models won't. Um, this means that, you know, you can't often fit these models on edge devices. So like a lot of these things won't run on your phone because they're too computationally expensive, which creates incentives to move the processing into the cloud, uh, which means you have to send all the input data to the cloud in order for it to do inference on it. And, uh, um, you know, Google and Amazon and a lot of these places have made it so that you have effectively infinite amounts of compute. So people don't seem very concerned about this. Uh, and, they, and they, you know, you can build extremely large networks of, uh, of these neurons to do things that you might be able to do more efficiently some other way. And we'll see an example of that, uh, of that later. Um, and also because it takes so much computing power to train these networks, um, it makes it sort of inaccessible to, to smaller players. Like, so if I wanted to train a, 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 a you know, a production quality speech recognition network, um, I think Mozilla's cluster to do that is currently like five machines, each with eight Titan X uh, GPUs in them. So not only is it really expensive to get that gear, but like it costs a lot of electricity. I think I calculated once that to train our text to speech model uh, would take as much electricity as a, uh, is, is mining um, like 10 Ethereum or something like that. I, I, I was trying to come up with a, a power uses me metric and um, that's what I came up with. So it's, it, just, it just takes so much power. Another issue is if something goes wrong in one of these networks, how do you figure out what that is? Um, they're gonna make mistakes. So, so some, of these, um, some of these mistakes are solvable by you know, making your input data more representative. So for instance, if, 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 you, if you write a, a detector for dogs and cats, and it works really well for cats and not dogs, well maybe you can add more dog images to your training set, and then it'll figure out uh, how that works. And sometimes there's biases in your training data. So for, so for, uh, for, for like the dog example, you know, there's lots of different breeds of dogs, um, and, and maybe for some reason your training data only can, uh, has Dalmatians in it, so it thinks like every non-white spotted dog is a, is a cat. Um, so you can try to fix those by, by addre addressing those concerns. But, but even then, like sometimes you might get weird results that you don't understand, and there's really no way to figure out what happened. Um, the representations that get learned are high dimensional, and the, the network learned them by itself. So it's not like you can go in there and understand what this like one million dimensional vector actually means, um, or what any of these weights actually do especially because they're all interconnected to each other and, they're, and, and they often, you know, the combination of the thing is the, is the signal. And, and like you saw, they're all nonlinear relationships. So it, it's, it's pretty dire in terms of understandability. Um, it's, it's really funny because 
a lot of the stuff you do in deep learning, it, it feels more like an art than science because a lot of the times when, so for instance, during training, you run all of your test data through, you calculate, uh, and then you, you know, also run some validation data through that it doesn't know the answer for, and you see how well it generalizes to that validation data. Um, and at a certain point, it'll stop generalizing, and it'll, it'll basically memorize the training data and stop getting better at predicting the validation data, at which point, you know, to fix that problem, you basically just only train it that far, and then when the validation data starts getting worse, well, you don't train it anymore, and that's as good as you're gonna get um, until you tweak something else. So it, it's, it's, there's not a lot of, I would say, like hard and fast science about you know, how long these things you train for or, or, or how you deal with these problems. Um, bias is also a, a big problem. Um, and this comes up in a couple of different sort of amusing and, and, and sad ways. So for example, Google, Google Photos started incorrectly labeling black faces as gorillas. Um, probably because of a mixture of problems. They might have had unrepresentative training data and they just didn't have a lot of black faces in their, in their uh, training data. Or it may be that because they don't have that many black employees, like no one was actually testing these things um, that way and so they didn't, they didn't find the problem that way either. And you also have uh, problems with other models. So like um, word embeddings is a technique that you use um, to basically find representations of words that you can use in machine learning such that related words are close to each other in, 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 in space. There's like a distance metric. And so when you train one of these word embeddings on, on, for instance, just generic web text, you can find things such as the distance between doctor and woman is much farther than the distance between doctor and man. And so we have learned a gender bias in our word embedding model. And for that particular one, we can solve this because there's only so many gendered words in the English language, so we can basically make a list of them. We can calculate, uh, you know, we, we can uh, calculate, you know, sort of what axis that uh, is the gender axis in our embedding data, and then reproject the whole thing so that all of the uh, feminine and, and masculine gendered words are equidistant to all of the other words in the embedding. And that's all nice, um, and it's good that we can do that. But how do we do this for racial bias, like? this becomes a lot harder problem. Like what is the list of words in the English language that, that is, is, you know, is, is a, a discriminant between uh, race and things? Um, and a lot of those words have many other meanings, and, and so it's not as uh, reliable. I don't know how you solve this in general. And also, a lot of this training data that we use, is, I mean, if we're gonna have this massive amount of data, a lot of it is like pretty low quality, right? So, I mean, uh, even if you train on Wikipedia, which is you know, the gold standard of crowdsourced uh, human uh, achievement in editing, like, you're gonna get a lot of weird biases in there and, and, and sort of, you know, Lord help you if you decide to train on Reddit or Twitter. So at Mozilla, we wanna use these ML technologies and we want other people to be able to use them and so we need, we're trying to create a world where we can minimize um, sort of these externalities, these negative externalities, um, and, and see if we can't find some problems. So we don't have solutions for all of these things, but we're, we're tr trying to um, work on solutions. So the first project I'll talk about is uh, deep speech and common voice. So, so deep speech is our speech recognition system, and, and common voice is a, 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 basically our data, our open data collection initiative for, for speech data. So deep speech is a state-of-the-art speech-to-text engine, um, and we wanted to make it because the existing state-of-the-art speech-to-text engines are all owned by big companies. Um, and if you wanna use their products, you either have to pay a bunch of money, or you have to send your audio to the cloud, or both, um, generally both, because uh, it's a lot more expensive if you don't send it to the cloud, because if you send it to the cloud, they can use that to make their model better. Therefore, it's cheaper. Um, and we, we wanted to make it so that other people could innovate in this space by you know, making new kinds of models using that training data. Um, like for instance, if you're gonna make one of these things, you have to first find a whole bunch of speech data and it's not like these companies are, are, are going to part with it. Um, so you know, we've had to go around finding open speech data and convincing people to open their speech data so that we have a bunch of data that we can uh, publish to train our models on. Um, and hopefully create a world where more people can innovate in this space. 
So we created DeepSpeech, which is based on Baidu's DeepSpeech paper. Um, it's written in TensorFlow. We have pre-trained models in English. Um, we're working on other languages. It runs real time on mobile devices. It supports streaming input. So if you have you know, an hour long podcast that you wanna uh, get transcripts for, you can run that through the model um, and get output you know, as it goes along. It's got a word error rate of 6.48. This makes it the highest quality open source speech engine, uh, I, th I think currently. Um, humans are at about 5.83% word error rate. Um, it's, it's, it's a fun task to try to make a, a deep learning model or any machine learning models that does better than humans because it's really hard to test. Um, it's really hard to know that your training data uh, is correctly labeled at that point. Um, and uh, this is on the LibriVox, which is one of the um, sort of tests that's a lot of, a lot of these academic papers and stuff use. Um, so in order, in order to like train models for, like we were able to find data sets for English, but there's lots of languages in the world that don't have just data sets lying around uh, for things in those languages. So we created the Common Voice Project to crowdsource voice data that we can use in training new models and other people can use to train new models or, or, do, or do whatever they want with. Um, this is launched in 20 languages. It's basically a website. You can go there. Um, you can do one of two things. You can uh, basically volunteer to uh, speak sentences in your native language, or you can volunteer to validate a sentence someone else spoke. Um, so we give you a transcript to read, you read it, and on the other side, somebody takes your transcript to make sure the audio matches the transcript. Um, so we're collecting data in 20 languages. We got about 1,800 hours collected so far, um, and we hope to bring a lot more languages online. And, and the idea here is to get enough audio data that we can train speech recognizers in a lot of languages. Um, and we're working with various universities and governments trying to get these uh, done for languages which, which uh, you know, no one else is, is you know, that aren't commercially viable for Alexa, for example, or something like that. Another experiment that we did uh, was called Deep Proof. And the idea here was we wanted to make a spelling and grammar checker um, that we could potentially put in Firefox. And the motivation was simple. There is one. It's one of the most popular plugins for, for Chrome and for Firefox. And it's basically a keylogger. Anything you type when you install this plugin is basically going to a server and be getting spell checked and grammar checked character by character. Um, this seems absolutely insane um, that people would want to put this on their computers, but uh, this is the scariest slide in my slide deck. Um, so we thought, well, what if we made a model that used deep learning to do this and then we made it small enough that we could actually run it on your device. And then we don't have to send any data anywhere because your data is your data and it should stay on your own machine. Um, so the idea was we wanted to correct both spelling and grammar and we wanted to make it scalable in the sense that, you know, a, we didn't want to have an English only solution or German only or one of the six big languages. Um, and, and we also didn't want to have to hire a bunch of grammarians to come up with huge amounts of rules for how to do grammar checking. So we tried to train the model by example rather than with rules, which, which meant we, we basically took, um, uh, we took data from, from Wikipedia and then mutated it and then it learned the corrections that way. And this is nice because it's a lot easier to write incorrect examples given correct things than it is to write general rules about how grammar works. And then, of course, we, of course, we wanted local inference, so we didn't send this all to a server somewhere. Um, for training data, we basically picked, uh, I think we, th this set was 12 million uh, 300 character chunks that we took from Wikipedia, and then we had, we had basically these example mistakes that you could make, like, you know, um, mispluralizing something or, 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 you know, mutating the spelling of something. Um, and, and then we would train a network based on that. We also had some real life data that we used, which was I think a bunch of papers that, that uh, people had written and submitted. Um, and, it, and it worked, it, it, it needs a lot more work uh, to be sort of production ready, um, but it, it did seem to work. Um, and the idea is, you know, if you wanted to get better over time, uh, we could maybe use federated uh, learning, which would mean that we do these training on each of the machines and then somehow uh, aggregate um, the gradient deltas. Uh, and, and so the, mo the model can learn from everyone's uh, mistakes and corrections without actually disclosing anyone's uh, text. 
And the last one I'll talk about is LPCNet, which is a little harder to explain. But the motivation here is a lot of these text-to-speech architectures are not, are, are um, wait, they're, they are end-to-end. -end. Um, sorry, that's a mistake on the slide. And what that means is they want to take characters as input and they want to output audio on the other end. Uh, and, and what they do right now is that, uh, as you saw in the previous slide, is they output spectrograms. And then we have to convert those spectrograms into the audio. And so there's some algorithms that you can use to do this. Well, the, the main one everyone uses is called Griffin Lim, but it doesn't sound very good. Um, and some engineers at Google came up with this one called WaveNet, but it's super computationally expensive. And so to, in order to actually use that, they made a variant called WaveRNN, which is only 10 gigaflops, um, which is also super expensive. So you can't run it on, on, on your phone or anything. Um, and, and if you want to, you know, make a text-to-speech engine yourself, like, that becomes, uh, you know, if this is going to power, be powering some API that, that you do, um, that starts to get really expensive. So we wanted to make something much more efficient uh, because we want to do text-to-speech on the end devices so we don't have to send all the text up to a server and then send you back audio. Um, so there, this is a simplified diagram of the WaveNet architecture on the left and our LPCNet architecture on the right. And Jean-Marc summarizes this as, don't throw the uh, DSP out with the bathwater. Like, the RNN, the, the recurrent neural network on the left has to learn a whole bunch of audio processing, signal processing stuff to be able to manipulate the signals. We don't know what it actually learns because we can't really look and understand, but we know that it probably does a bunch of these kinds of manipulations. And so his intuition was, well, we have plenty good digital signal processing that we know works and works very well and is cheap. And so we'll use that and then we'll give it input to a smaller RNN and then it can just do the classification with that data already there. And so this means that like, there probably is something similar to this prediction filter in the WaveNet RNN, but it takes, you know, 10,000 neurons in order to calculate that, and we can do it much cheaper and more accurately off to the side. Um, currently, this network is working really well. It only takes about 1.5 to 6 gigaflops, which actually means we can run it in real time on mobile hardware. Uh, you can see on, on the right, this is a quality graph that basically shows uh, the size of that uh, network, like how many units, you know, how many of those little circles it has, and what quality you get with that. And so red is LPCNet, the blue dashed line is WaveNet, and higher is better. Um, so you can see with uh, LPCNet, you can get much higher quality for the same, no same size of the network, or conversely, you can spend, uh, you can get the same quality using a much more efficient network. Um, and it turns out this has all kinds of other applications. We can use it for speech compression uh, because uh, speech codecs work by having a model of, of speech production. And then you have this predictive filter to predict samples from the model. So we can take that model and we can take LPCNet to predict the samples. And we can, we have, uh, Jean-Marc has some um, work that he's done where he's gotten uh, speech down to 1.5 kilobits per, per second and it still sounds pretty good. Um, we can also use it for noise suppression, uh, time stretching. I'll show, a, I can show a demo of that one. And packet loss concealment. So for example, if you're on a video conference and somebody's bandwidth goes out in the middle of them saying something, right now it does a lot of fancy stuff to try to make, it, make you think that like nothing actually bad happened um, for small time scales. And so we can use the same algorithm to predict what the next samples will be given the samples, the real samples that you said, and hopefully cover up any um, network problem. <laughs> so here's, um, here's an example. So this is the reference. Um, Add the sum to the product of these three. Thieves who rob friends deserve jail. So that's a real human voice. And then we can see what this sounds like with uh, wave RNN. Add the sum to the product of these three. Thieves who rob friends deserve jail. Now with the same size uh, network, LPCNet. 
Add the sum to the product of these three. Thieves who rob friends deserve jail. And then for time stretching, here's an example that's slowed down by 50%. Add the sum to the product of these three. That may sound like quite weird, and you're like, why can't we do better? But here's, here's like what the other techniques sound like. Add the sum to the product of these three. So it's quite an improvement, even if it isn't perfect. Um, and, so, and, and, and there's a great blog post on this, so if you just search Google for LPCNet and you want to read more, there's a whole bunch of other demos there. Um, and that's it. Thanks. <laughs> Questions? Thank you very much. That was fantastic. Do you know why deep learning is called deep learning? Yeah, I actually had it in my notes and forgot to say it. Um, the, those layers that we're making, uh, the deepness is because we're stacking many, many, many of those layers on top of each other. So I showed five there, but like a lot of these big networks will have, so, so there was five layers, and I think there was five neurons on each layer, so that was 25 neurons. So that would be 25 weights, so you're, that would be the size of your network. Um, the deep speech model is 100 million parameters. Um, these these 1,000 object detection things probably have, you know, are trained on billions of images and, and probably have, you know, maybe a billion parameters for all I know. These, the slowing down algorithm that you showed, does that work with other things other than speech? I can see that being very useful in music analysis. It does not work with things other than speech uh, because we currently train it on speech. It's it would probably be really useful as a creative tool if you tried it on things other than speech, but it won't do that. Uh, um, and, that and that's because it's sort of trained as a, on, on like a, a speech production model. Um, I don't know. We'd have to ask John Mark. Um, there might be a different way to make something like that that would work, but that, that one is, uh, like for instance, that one probably won't even work on singing without retraining, because when you sing, you, you have a much higher pitch than you would when you talk. Um, you talked about uh, different languages, but um, particularly with the uh, speech recognition, but also with the spelling and grammar stuff, how do you deal with regional variations within a language? So, Seeing as we're here in Australia and you're American. Yeah, um, the Common Voice site um, ha like, does collect regional dialects. Um, I don't know which, I, I didn't have written down and, and without looking I can't tell you which regional dialects, but I'm pretty sure like New Zealand English would be, we would collect separately from American English because clearly, you know, those sound quite a bit different. And if you want to train a model that's good for New Zealand English, you want to make sure you have lots of that data. Um, but, but that is explicitly the, what we want to do in some of the languages. So some of these grants that we get from governments or work with universities are trying to collect specific regional dialects because the, you know, Alexa doesn't understand them at all, even though it understands normal English. So. I'm gonna have to be careful not to preempt my own talk tomorrow on AI, but uh, I have one question for you. You said deep learning um, just really gets indefinitely better. You showed this graph, machine learning kind of like topped off and deep learning kept going. Um, we are dealing with mathematical models, right? They are finite. Where does the indefinite come from? How, why, I, why can you make such a statement? Um, I think because the models are so much more complex than the other, the other models. Uh, I don't know that that will hold forever, right? Like this is just an example. Uh, but, but it is the case that, you know, these state-of-the-art image recognition models keep getting trained on much, much larger data sets, like billions of images, and they keep improving. And probably the improvement is not like going from 80% to 90%, it's like probably like 96.2% to 96.4%, right? Um, um, but uh, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, and it may, it may be that we don't know yet. I mean, like a lot of the stuff in deep learning, like it's just, we don't quite understand all of the nuances of it.
Hi. And you said earlier that uh, when things start to go wrong, it's, let's say, get complicated to undo. Let's say the gorillas example of Google. Uh, when you take the decision to undo, it's a human decision, it's a deep learning decision to undo, or you just, when in economics, you just destroy the model and start again? Do you have a model for the model? I don't know. Um, some of these things are just starting to roll out. So in the United States, there are some of these models being used for uh, sentencing guidelines, for example, or, or determining if you should be eligible for parole. And the, and the problem here is that Zaya decides that you're not eligible for parole, and, and so you, you appeal that decision. What are they going to look at to decide how it made the decision, right? All they know is they put you in one end of the network, you know, and, and, and a no came out. And so I don't know how we're going to solve that. Um, I assume that people will have to go back and redo all of the work that we used to do and, and, and come up with a, a, a way to do that. Um, and, and that concerns me a lot. Uh, because if you think about it, a lot of the interactions that we have with these big corporations, they don't really have an appeal process, right? If Google, if you, if you complain like, hey, this didn't work for me, like Google has you know, uh, a billion other customers besides you. And if they're all happy, like they could care less what you think. Um, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, so you talked about the, the speech recognition model and how um, it was necessary to, se to send speech to the cloud because of the, the computation. It was too computationally intensive for a, an edge device. Um, is it viable with a limited vocabulary or, or a limited number of speakers to put that back on the edge? So you can make the model smaller. Uh, for instance, you can train a smaller model and it might not be as accurate. Um, so that's one way you can do it. Another way is a lot of these models are trained on double precision float, and you can do it on single precision float. That, that may actually be what DeepSpeech does. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, uh, uh, so, so there are some things you can do, but the, the models may not perform as well. Um, and I think that's currently the case. So for instance, the deep speech model that you'll run on your desktop is probably not, is probably a little bit better quality than the one that you'll run on a mobile phone. Um, and that's why we're investing in trying to, like for LPC net, while we're trying to like make this smaller a different way than just running a smaller network, we, we actually replace parts of the network with more efficient things that we know it needs. Um, but it's, it's going to be hard to get to a point where people will, like right now, if people given the choice between a model that doesn't work as well and, and sending all my data to the cloud to get one that does, like people usually choose the latter situation. So I don't know how we get people to make a conscious choice or, or, or we get uh, companies to focus on making edge device versions of these models. I mean, there are other things that would push that, right? If you want it to work offline, obviously it's got to be on the device. So for instance, if you have an iPhone and it has Face ID, like that's not sending anything to the network because that thing has to work regardless of if there's a network around. So some, like Apple has definitely got models that run on device. So, so some people care about this for specific applications. But in general, like a lot of the machine learning stuff that you can find in a Amazon's APIs or Google's APIs is all cloud-based. Um, you said that deep learning or understanding what's going on, it's, it feels more like an art than science. My question is, and maybe there is no answer, um, how do you know, or, or what are the guidelines to sort of decide the, the size of the neural network that you want to create to analyze a, a set of data? Because it seems to me that I don't know whether the decisions are arbitrary or you just reiterate. On yeah, they're, they're basically arbitrary. So you do parameter studies. So for example, you'll put together, you'll know that like, okay, my machine on my desk can train a model that's roughly 100 million parameters in one day. And that's about as much as I'm willing to wait to get feedback on how I'm doing. And so you'll do a hyperparameter study where you change the sizes of each layer, change the number of layers, and all that stuff. And you run this a dozen times, and then you can look at what the performance was for each set of the hyperparameters, and you just pick the one that's the best. Um, and, and, and that's how it kind of works. So like you kind of just, you go read an academic paper about object recognition, you take like an example architecture, and then you implement it, and then you change some of the numbers and see if it makes things go uh, better or worse. So that's that's very that, that's why I say it's like an art and a science. There's no 
there's no hard and fast rule like, okay, if you're doing this problem, then, then you wanna get that. The, the, the one thing I'll, I will say on that is the one rule that you can probably count on is if you have a recurrent neural network or, or one of these networks that's got a bunch of training data, if your, the number of nodes in your network is larger than the amount of training data you have, it will probably just memorize the training data set, right? So that's bad, because it won't generalize at all. But, but like, as long as your network's not the, on the order of magnitude of your training set, you're probably, you're, you're, you're just like, you know, fudge this number, fudge that number, oh look, great, it's better, and I'll publish a paper. Um. <laughs> so. uh, one more. Um, you mentioned bias. What about, let's call it hardware bias? What I mean, you mentioned the deep speech paper, Brian Catanzaro, or Andrew Ying, who have been in deep learning for some time. They are NVIDIA guys, they are former NVIDIA guys. So uh, have you considered that that contaminates in one way? Okay, we will think on um, the networks in G kind of thing. Why did you choose deep speech instead of considering, I don't know, an AMD platform or whatever else? Just because it was the most accepted paper? Uh, it's a little paranoid question, but Yeah, still, that, that's, uh, so deep speech uh, was created by uh, Kelly um, on our team, Kelly Davis. Um, he, he would be the person to ask that question, uh, kdavis at mozilla.com if you want to ping him about that. Um, I'm not sure why they chose that particular paper. I, I think. Uh, also, I think our deep speech implementation isn't exactly like that paper. There was a second paper, a deep speech two paper that they published, and I, we have some hybrid approach, I think. Um, so, but like, there is a lot of stuff. Like right now, CUDA is where it's at, so everything runs on NVIDIA hardware. There's a couple different machine learning frameworks, and it's certainly the case that there are reproducibility problems if you change the version of TensorFlow that you're using, for example. Um, so containerization is a, is, a, is, a, is a big deal in this field. Yeah, hi. Uh, like you said, Deep Speech is an open source speech engine. Uh, is there anything in Mozilla for open source for language translation? For lang so we are working with, I think, the University of Edinburgh for machine uh, assisted translation. Um, and uh, we also have done some research in using machine translation techniques to do summarization. You can think of it as like we're going to translate English to really shorter English. Um, and we, and the, our deep proof grammar checker also used machine translation techniques. So it was basically translating from a lot of grammatical mistakes English to correct grammar English. Um, so we, we, we have done some work on that, but we don't, we, uh, I wouldn't say we have anything to the level of, of deep speech, like where we're ready to release for machine translation. We're mostly working with other universities and researchers on that topic. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for that, but I'd like to show your appreciation to Jack for his interesting <laughs>